All right, it's a few minutes past the hour. Um, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, we're really fortunate today to have Klaus Kondopit on here to tell us about the JWST Exposure Time Calculator. Um, there is a formal release of the ETC at the AAF meeting um, in Texas at the beginning of this month. Um, and so Klaus is going to uh, describe to us uh, sort of at the 40,000 foot level what's in the ETC. All right. Uh, thanks, Christine. Thanks, everybody, for joining, and thanks to everybody online as well. Uh, it's my pleasure to be presenting the, uh, the JWST Exposure Time Calculator. I'll hopefully give everybody a little bit better an idea of what it does and how to use it. Um, the Exposure Time Calculator is, the, is a product uh, of a lot of people's work over the past four years or something like that. Um, uh, and so we're, we're quite proud of it. Uh, of course, as Christine pointed out, uh, it's now available and it's on this, uh, this URL. Um, this is the, uh, the flight release that's relevant for the Early Release Science Program, GTOs, and GEO Cycle 1 programs as well. There's likely going to be a, a few updates uh, uh, sort of in the next year or so, but, but sort of on the whole, it's, uh, this is, this is what, uh, what is intended to be, to be used for planning your JWST observations. Uh, throughout my talk, I'll have a number of these, uh, these fun facts. So I painted them green, so there's something to look out for. Uh, for example, one fun fact about this e uh, release is that, um, unlike for the, uh, for the previous ETC demo release, which some of you may have been using, your work is now persistent. Um, so when you save your workbook, it uh, will be there for I don't know, forever. We have some of the developers in the room. <laughs> um, all right, so I thought I'd start with a little bit of history where this is coming from. Um, because originally, uh, the, the plan for the uh, JWST ETC was that you would have something that was sort of similar to the HST ETC. So anybody who's been planning uh, HST observations know that very well. Um, there was actually some work ongoing early on to translate uh, uh, HST ETC from Java to Python and, and modernize that a little bit. but it, pretty quickly became clear that using the, uh, the HST to see that kind of concept for JWST was likely not really a viable way to go. And one of the reasons was that, that uh, the JWST, for JWST, we are you know, right out of the gate. We're required to, in the ETC, to support all these different, very varied observing modes, some of which have never been done uh, before, certainly not in space. Uh, right, so of course, we have the sort of the vanilla imaging modes. And so that's you know, pretty well known how you do an ETC with that. But even there, there are some issues. For example, there's the near spec target acquisition that's done through the uh, multi shot array mesh. So it gets a little bit funky. Uh, we have to do slit spectroscopy. OK, so that's you know, maybe also uh, you know, that's some idea of how to do that. But then you get stuff like IFU spectroscopy. Uh, it gets complicated in a, in a, sort of a simple previous generation kind of ETC multi-object spectroscopy, and then things like slitless spectroscopy, and then we get really advanced with coronography and sparse aperture masking and spirometry. And so we had to do all of this at once in the ETC. Um, and, uh, and so basically it became clear that we needed something that was a little bit more modern, a little bit more complex. And so we're talking now about, this was about 2012 or so. And so a bunch of work was done. Uh, and a number of recommendations were made for the JWST exposure time calculator. <laughs> the first recommendation was that, that the, uh, the ETC should use a three-dimensional kind of framework. And so it means two spatial and one spectral dimension. Uh, in the past, ETCs typically, uh, uh, the spatial dimensions are collapsed down uh, into one-dimensional formula. Uh, but that becomes difficult when you want to to model things like uh, that, that really are focused on extended sources like I've used. Um, the ETC, um, so to help with that, the ETC should use a PSF library. Uh, and the original recommendation was something that was generated by the WebPSF tool. And so the WebPSF tool is, is, a, is, a, is a software tool that generates point spread functions <coughs> for, for JWST and actually for other missions as well. Uh, there's also there's there's a number of noise sources within JWST that are not you know straightforward and many of them are correlated. So there was a recommendation that noise propagation should include functionality that you can deal with correlated noise. Um, there was also an, an understanding that uh, users might be interested in observing in different ways, right? Uh, Sometimes there are different ways you may want to subtract your background, um, and so. The ETC should explicitly deal with post-observation 
uh, kind of things you would do. And so this could this can include uh, um, you know combinations of multiple exposures, subtractions, backgrounds, ex various ways to extract photometry and spectroscopy. You know where they want to do some aperture extraction, an optimal extraction. And so those should be modeled using a unifying concept, what we call observing strategies. And so you will see that elsewhere in ETC, also in the user interface, this word strategy is used. And what that is referring to is, is basically you, 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 you basically do something like that simulation-like with pixels, and then you add pixels together in various ways. And the way you do that is, is your, your strategy. Um, also, uh, it was felt it was important that the C engine, so the, the the, the piece of the software that actually does the, uh, the quantitative calculation should be something that's portable so that you may want to use it for a web application, but maybe you also want to be able to just download uh, that software tool and use it for something else. Uh, or maybe you want to be able to create a standalone application, but using the same piece of software. Uh, and so we were in a, in, a, in a place where we could develop the software in such a way that that, that would be possible. So you wouldn't lock yourself into a certain kind of interface. Um, also, uh, another thing that's important, and we put a lot of work into that, right, because when you do all this stuff in the previous uh, recommendations, the tendency, of course, for such a code is that it becomes slow. And so it was important that ETC calculations should at least be sufficiently fast that uh, uh, we, we can support what we call efficient comparative parameter studies, right? So, uh, so we wanted to be able to compare um, different calculations in the same kind of environment. Um, and we wanted the ETC to be template-based, right? So that mimics what you have in, in APT and the astronomer's proposal tool, which you'll use to actually set up your observing scripts. Um, so template basically just means a form you fill out uh, uh, with really with as few parameters as possible. Now the ETC, of course, will, uh, ended up having a lot of parameters, but they're still templates. And so just to, to give an idea, we had, there was a prototype made back in 2012, um, and, and looked and so if you compare that to, to the, the current um, version of the HC, the one that was released, you'll see some, some heritage in this here. And the key point was that, that you, know, you had all the modes lined up here, and you could, you could launch off you know, calculations for individual modes, and you'll end up with this list of calculations that you could compare, and you could pick you know, which ones you'd like to plot and compare. So for example, here's a signal noise plot as a function of wavelength, and there's also uh, sort of 2D pixel information. <clears throat> all right, so all of this ended up with, uh, with what we call the Pandaya project. Um, and so Pandaya is, uh, is sort of an overarching umbrella term for everything that goes into the ETC. So we have the uh, ETC engine, uh, which is a Python library. Uh, it's basically a Python code that you can import and use like any other Python, Python library. Um, then there's the JWST reference database. Uh, so that contains all of the data that uh, the ETC needs to set up uh, JWST as an observatory. Uh, uh, so things like throughput, noise properties, point spread functions, and so on. Uh, so one thing that's worth to point out here is that the, uh, the JWST ETC reference database is separate from other JWST reference data. Um, we did look at in the, in the past, you know, whether they, they should just all be part of the same reference database, but it basically it was determined that there was they were really different enough that it, was, it became difficult to merge them all together. So, so most of the things that are in the ETC database are things that are uh, uh, specifically relevant to the ETC. Uh, then there's a web application, and this is the one you find on this URL. Uh, so the web application is a user interface along with a server uh, that basically allows users to put in parameters and will launch off um, uh, ETC calculations using the engine and save all the results in a, in a coherent way so that you can go back and look at it again, or you can even share it with your collaborators. So it has a significant collaborative functionality. Um, and then finally, but not least, there is the uh, JWST background model. And so that's a different uh, kind of web service that gets called internally. And so the JWST background model, it serves up, given a time and a pointing in the sky, it serves up what the JWST background is. I'll get back to that in more detail, what that is. Um, so that gets fed into um, calculation through the web application. Another important point to uh, uh, mention here is that currently the JWST background model is only available through the web application. You can't get at it any other way. But you can, if you run a calculation on a web application, it's possible for you to download the background in surface brightness units, omega density, vista radian, 
that uh, is relevant for that particular point in time. All right. <clears throat> okay, so the application is a collaborative work environment. Right? So now we see this is actually screenshots from the real uh, UTC application. You can, uh, you can make a number of uh, calculations here in the list, compare them, uh, and you can, you can look at the output of that. For example, here's an image. And uh, uh, for the collaboration, what is important here is that you have, um, uh, for your, your work, you can, you can pick specific work, what we call workbooks, which are collections of calculations. You can pick those, and you can, you can pick your collaborators by email if they have a MyST account, and you can uh, give them access, either read, write, uh, grant or revoke permissions that are, should be familiar with. with with you, um, so you can so others can either read your uh, read your calculation, so they can actually go and edit it. So that's perfect for teams working together. <clears throat> All right, then there's process engine. Um, so uh, uh, one of the key figures that usually put forward in the engine is that is this uh, this idea of a of a scene queue. So that's what it starts with. So it has functionality for creating an astrophysical scene that has these three dimensions. Right? So it has it has uh, has two spatial dimensions. One of them can be dispersion if it's a spectroscopic mode, and then there is a wavelength dimension as well. And so um, uh, the way that you you use the same internal engine to to basically create different kinds of observing modes is that, say, if you have an imaging mode, what happens in the instrument is you take a scene cube and you integrate it along the wavelength direction across through some throughput. While if you have a spectroscopic mode, your integration goes in the other direction. And that's basically what it does internally as well. We'll get back to that a little bit more. You can also read more about it. There's an SPAE article here uh, where we uh, write in more details about, about the, uh, the algorithms here. Um, the engine is, is actually also available now, so the Python library. Um, there is more functionality in the engine if you download the Python importer uh, than and what is what is uh, available through the web application. There's just some limitations for how how many um, bells and whistles and um, buttons you can you can make available in the web application. So there's a little bit more more power in the in the standalone engine, but of course there's also more danger. You can sort of do whatever you want with it. Um, you, know, you can also get things wrong, so so uh, so there's some caution with that as well. But it is available, and you can see what it does. Uh, one advantage of this is that um, you can do uh, more complicated scripting, right? So if you want to create hundreds or thousands of VTC calculations and search a whole through a whole parameter space, it's probably easier to do that with the uh, with the Python um, standalone engine. You can install it with pip install here, and there's a URL here as well, where it gives you a little bit more. Uh, information. It also has a link to the data package. Download that. Um, and there's some examples here uh, from our recent JWST user training on, on GitHub for how to script it. So some very basic examples just to get you started. Uh, uh, apart from that, there's not a ton of uh, documentation for the engine itself, but we are, we're hoping to make more. Uh, so there's a bit of the documentation. The, the main effort is for the uh, web application. So the fun fact here is that the the engine is actually, I was sort of surprised when I, when I wrote this talk here, to count the number of lines of code. The engine is surprisingly compact, very, very general code. So it's, uh, it's only 12 and a half thousand lines of code, the engine itself. It is not a big project. <clears throat> All right. OK, so uh, I already talked a little bit about the cube and how you do how you do scene projections. So this is a um, sort of bit more detail about that. Uh, so so what, it, what it does is you can imagine the the cube has a number of planes that are monochromatic. And you should have enough planes that it's, it's a good approximation to have uh, each plane being monochromatic. Uh, you create sources in your scene by, by picking um, different types of sources to basically, I think of them as Lego bricks, right? You, you can't get a Lego brick of any kind of shape you want. But uh, if you use enough bricks, you can make pretty much any kind of scene you like. So things tend to be a little blocky. but uh, using enough bricks, it looks good. So here's some example. For example, you can make you can make uh, uh, an extended source looking like a galaxy here with a Cossack profile. Uh, you can make a point source here, so that's just a single pixel there. And so this is what the scene looks like before you convolve it with the PSF. Convolve it with the PSF, then this is what it, it looks like. 
of course, the point source ends up being, not being one single pixel anymore. It gets spread out, and, and the extended source here gets spread out as well. And you do that for every plane in your queue. And then, depending on which observing mode you're using, it gets projected in different ways here. For example, the imaging projection, again, is uh, it's very simple. You have the, uh, you have the cube here. Uh, every pixel in units of, uh, of uh, flux density. And you just integrate that through the wavelength. And you get uh, basically a, a pixel image. And each pixel you have a, a, a number, which is the uh, uh, an electron rate that gets detected in that pixel, so electrons per second per pixel. And also, if you download, if you see, if you look at some of the HC output results, um, uh, a lot of the units are in electrons per second per pixel, so detected rate of electrons. Um, then there's a, a sort of the next level of complexity here. There's a slit spectroscopy projection. This actually makes a bit of a, to, to be fast, it makes a bit of a uh, uh, approximation, and that is that uh, your source inside, uh, your, your source shouldn't be much smaller than your slit, uh, which is generally true for JWST, but not, not completely always. Uh, if your source is uh, significantly smaller than yourself, your slit is much bigger than your source, uh, then you lose the spatial information that otherwise is in there. But if with that assumption, um, you basically have a slit mask, so every plane here gets multiplied with the spatial mask of the slit. As you flog out, imagine you put a slit across it, you flog out everything else. And then for every plane, what you basically do is you integrate over the uh, dispersion direction, uh, and then you multiply that with the dispersion function, and then you get the right units out in the electrons per second pixel uh, spread out on your detector. Uh, in the case that you do have a slit that is much larger than your uh, than your source, the most extreme example of that, of course, is slit spectroscopy, where your slit is infinitely large. Um, and then there's a different projection, which is a bit bit more complicated, where basically it's a line integral through this through this cube here. And so in that case, it gets a little bit slower, but you get the right kind of spatial information there. So, for example, if you have a if you have a, an extended source uh, with a with an emission line in it. And you look at your uh, slitless spectrum. Then every time, you know, when you look at the line, then that line has the shape of that, of the spatial uh, distribution of that source, in a correct way. All right. Uh, so then you have your your uh, uh, your okay. rate map. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, what's the typical spatial? I think I mean spatial resolution that those integrals are done at. Uh, is it are they analytic? Are they a certain number of samples per pixel? Or? So the spatial dimensions are usually oversampled uh, by uh, an integer factor relative to the pixel scale. So you use three, um, factor three. Um, so the slitless here, uh, there, there's one, there's one sort of uh, clever step made in, in this that in that the, if you sample the wavelength direction in the cube here. In, in units of pixels, right? So every 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 plane in the cube has one pixel separation, and you actually don't have to do any interpolations. You just shift it by integer numbers. Um, so that in that direction gets great, but the spatial dimension is usually oversampled by factor three. Um, okay, so so once you have your your rate map in the so you basically have an image in in uh, in actual detector pixel. So it gets rebinned down to, to detector pixels again after you've done all the all the convolution and integrations behind the uh, behind the hood, or under the hood. Uh, then you have to, uh, to to the next step, which is extracting some sort of signal that you want out of it. Right? Typically, you may not you don't just want to look at your your image. You want to get a signal to noise ratio of photometric point, or extract your spectrum and get a signal to noise ratio on the spectrum. So in order to do that, you uh, you basically add you, you you make some sort of linear combinations of pixel values. Right? So this is typically what you get. You have uh, uh, an integrated flux, uh, which is a sum over a number of pixels. You can weight them in different ways depending on what you do. For example, if you are subtracting, if you're submitting a, a background subtraction, you end up subtracting some pixels in your field of view. Then its weight will become minus or negative uh, one, um, and then you have individual flux values, uh, rates in, uh, uh, per pixel. Um, and then you can just write out what the variance is of that linear combination. Yeah, it becomes this 
matrix product here, and as you see, that's a covariance matrix. If you, ha if you have uncorrelated noise, the covariance matrix here is diagonal. Uh, so this is where this uh, um, um, functionality that allows correlated noise comes in. So if you do have correlated noise, then this covariance matrix become, gets off diagonal, non-zero entries. And so you can put it in that way. Uh, at the end of the day, this will come to variance, right? The signal to noise is then just uh, uh, this divided by the square root of this. <clears throat> and so here's an example, right? So this is a very typical kind of, uh, um, so again, this is a strategy, a typical kind of extraction strategy in the ETC. It's you know, just you know, regular old aperture uh, photometry. Uh, and so you, you take your, uh, uh, your, your source here, you, you make an aperture on top of it, uh, and then you have an annulus around it, and you use the annulus around it to estimate your background. And you sum up all the blocks within the source, you subtract the background, and that's your photometric point. Uh, and here, basically, you don't have to go into the detail here, but basically here you write out what the uh, um, uh, uh, you know, what the total flux is. This is still a linear combination. Um, and so you can write out what the individual weights are given this. These are individual weights for aperture photometry. So this strategy basically is, is implemented by this set of weights here. So remember that. Go back to the set of weights is easier. Um, and so all the strategies are implemented in this way. If you want to do optimal uh, spectral extraction, of course, for example, then the weights become more complicated. All right. <clears throat> Okay, so, uh, so I'll go through sort of a few uh, number of elements that's in the ETC, um, uh, sort of one by one. Uh, so there's the, uh, the PSF library that we use, where so I said we, we, uh, uh, we make a cube with monochromatic planes in it. So it means that at each plane, we convolve it with a, your, your, your actual uh, surface brightness distribution with a monochromatic PSF. So in order to do that, uh, the ETC has to have a large library of PSFs uh, calculated in monochromatic ways. So the PSFs are not something that you will ever observe the ones you see in your, in your library because you typically don't have a monochromatic instrument. Um, and by the way, this is also a reason, we, it's one of the questions we get often is, can you just can I just take my, um, my already observed astronomical image and run it through the ETC and get something sensible out of it. It's like, no, you can't do that because if, if you already have something that's convolved with a real observed PSF, there's no way for us to get at these monochromatic PSFs. And so that's, re that's, what, that's a big reason that uh, we ask if, if the design is such that you make these Lego bricks of sources uh, and that you can't just take your own scene and put it in um, at, at this time. Uh, anyway, so, so this is an example of, uh, of one of the uh, libraries. So this is for near camp short wavelength imaging PSFs here. So you can get you go here from the shortest wavelength to the longest wavelength. You can see how these ones here are not quite diffraction limited down at, I don't know, 0. 0.7 micron. And at the other end, you know, above 2 micron, it gets close to being, uh, or well, is diffraction limited um, for the AWST. And so these all calculated with, with uh, web PSF, which is a general tool. It's also available. It's written by Marshall Perrin available at this URL. Throughout the ETC, there's almost uh, 3,000 individual monochromatic PSFs in the library. So it's a fairly large chunk of data. Um, and as David asked, it's a subsample by an integer factor of pixel size. Um, and so one of the effects that you can get out of this here, uh, this kind of treatment of it, is that uh, um, the observed PSF, or sorry, observed by the ETC actually, the shape of the PSF depends on the color of the astronomical source. If you have a very red source, you get weighted toward the, the red side of, uh, of, the, of the PSF of your pan pass. If it's very blue, you get weighted toward the blue end of your pan pass. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so the, the Pandaya reference data, uh, uh, so in case you're interested in looking at it, as I said, this is available for download. Um, basically, it's a directory here. Uh, we implement an observatory in it, so JWST here. There are actually other observatories as well. W first is, is one of them. Um, and then at the same level here, you have other folders with extinction. There's some NCDs and template spectra. Uh, there's some for normalization. That's external band passes. Like if you want to uh, normalize your 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 uh, source to Johnson V, then you can do it through uh, these band passes here and the various defaults. 
And when you go from the observatory, you go one level deeper, you have a number of instruments here. So of course, the JVC is for, for science instruments. Uh, there's a telescope, uh, which contains, say, the telescope uh, efficiency, tra uh, transmission efficiency. And there are some uh, aspects of the detectors as well as things like uh, interpixel capacitance or, or, or correlation matrices that are used for, for correlated noise, especially correlated weak noise. And you go one level deeper from the instrument here, and then there's this config, this JSON file. So this, this implements basically the, the instrument configuration. So you can go in there and you can see all the pixel scales, uh, um, uh, all these things that are, that are relevant to the order to make an instrument, uh, the slit sizes, uh, that sort of thing. And then there's a number of, uh, of other reference files that, that typically most of these are, are, are transmission efficiencies of different components. Spectral efficiency of dispersing elements. There's dispersion functions, uh, uh, resolving powers. Uh, there's of transmissions. There's, uh, there's the efficiency of, of all the other optical components in your instrument. There's detected Q. Q is quantum efficiencies. There's also quantum yields in the detectors. So this is some quantum yield. Um, it's not something I'm going to talk in great detail about, but it is in the, in the basically at short wavelengths in detectors. A single photon can give rise to more than one electron, which are correlated. And so it, the, the ETC deals with that as well. The quantum yield curve is available. And of course, the quantum spread functions. Uh, all of this, another fun fact, all of this is that uh, means that it's a tar ball of about one and a half gigabytes. But almost all of that is out of PSFs. All right, uh, we deal with cosmic rays, but in a, uh, in a statistical way, in a, and also uh, in, a, in a rather conservative way. Uh, there are various models of cosmic ray hits from Massimo Ruffer 2009. He made a, a library of, of cosmic ray hits and how many pixels uh, each hit uh, affects. Um, and so basically, the ETC uses the best known L2 cosmic ray rate, but it is a purely statistical treatment. What it means is that when, when, you, when you do, um, when you make an observation um, and you get hit by cosmic rays, is that in that in the pixels affected by that, those cosmic rays, you, effect, you, you effectively lose integration time. Um, so the ETC, you won't see when you do an ETC cal uh, calculation, you won't see individual cosmic ray hits. What we do is we just average over the whole field and then uh, calculate how much, on average, uh, integration time you lose from cosmic ray hits. Uh, we make a very conservative assumption that half the RAM is lost per cosmic ray. Uh, in practice, uh, um, and there's been a lot of work on this in practice. Uh, uh, I think there's a wide belief that you can you can correct for cosmic rays to a large degree. Um, so so this is conservative. But the, and one reason this is conservative is that we find that in practice cosmic ray hits actually do not affect the signal noise ratio very much, except for very long, very long integrations of thousands of seconds. Um, this is one advantage of having small pixels, uh, physically small pixels. Um, all right, uh, then, then there's one, one very important point here is to understand how the ETC deals with saturation. Uh, of course, all the uh, detectors uh, uh, on JWST uses up the ramp reads, non destructive reads. And so it means that you, you start with resetting your detector, you integrate electrons, so you get more and more electrons in your, in your well, and along this, this ramp, then you read the number of your electrons a number of times. And you can do this in very complicated ways here. But basically, you get numbers that increase as you get more and more electrons. And you fit a RAM through that, and the RAM gives you a rate, an electron rate. Uh, and that's, so that's what comes out of it. And that's also what the ETC report, again, is an electron rate. It's not a total number of electrons. Um, but of course, at some point, uh, you reach saturation, and you actually can't detect any more, any more electrons. But because of the RAM read, it means that even though you may saturate a certain pixel, uh, at some point, you still have the previous reads available. And so if you have enough of those, you can still fit a ramp even though the, the pixel is formally saturated. And so we call that partial saturation in the ETC. So basically what that means is that the ramp saturates before it finishes, but more than a minimum reads are unsaturated. And then there's full saturation. What that means is that the ramp saturates before you reach the minimum number of reads you, you require to actually fit slower. Um, and so those are just two different numbers. So here I've made a... I think this is a near-spec fixed slit observation, so it's saturated. Uh, and then there's a saturation map in the ETC here. And so the blue here, those are good. And then there are two additional values here. There's the, there's the white here, that's a partial saturation. 
to saturate part of the RAM, but you can still use those pixels. The red ones are fully saturated, so you can't use those pixels anymore. So that's what it means. Of course, once you saturate a ramp, you don't get any better signal to noise by integrating longer, so that's one of the effects. All right, uh, the background model uh, of BTC. So, uh, JFC uses a, uses a dynamic background model generator called the BMG. Uh, it has in it multiple different components. Uh, it has celestial components here, so that includes zodiacal light as well as ISM. And so here you have a map of what it is. Here's zodiacal light, here's ISM. Uh, this part of the background uh, model was uh, uh, was created and delivered by uh, by IPAC, and it has heritage from from Spitzer. Why, why is the zodiacal map discontinuous? That's a good question. I don't know that. I don't think the sky looks like that. <laughs> um, I'm sure that's a good reason. I'm not, uh, I'm not that familiar with the SODI model here. Yeah. Um, I'll ask Jane Rigby. Um, all right, so uh, uh, so the data from this, uh, they're from, uh, they were used for Spitzer, but they're actually from the original COBE mission, and there's uh, there's a galactic Cirrus down here as well. Uh, the Cirrus here uses a fixed spectrum has parts and things like that, but it gets scaled up and down based on the, the total intensity here. Uh, and there's also star counts in here as well. You don't see when you when you use ETC that just kind of that gets flattened out into a completely flat background. Uh, but so it, it doesn't resolve out into individual stars, but it sort of gives you an idea of, of what you get. Um, so in that sense, it doesn't deal with confusion. Um, What's important in, in the ETC is that the Zodi, uh, the, the galactic background, of course, is not time dependent, but the Zodi is, and that's where the time dependence of, of the background model comes in. So depending on where JWST is in this orbit and where it's, uh, you, you get different uh, Zodi values, and depending on, of course, where it's pointing, you also get different ones. Um, and so uh, the ETC allows for two different ways of specifying the background. Uh, one is where you know what your right ascension and declination is, and the other one is when you, have, uh, when you know where your right ascension and declination is and you know what time it is that your observation will take place. Uh, so you input those numbers and you get a dated background to the exact background for that time and position. Uh, if you don't know what time uh, your background will be uh, observed in, uh, you can specify low, medium, or high, uh, which, is, uh, which accesses the dateless background, which basically um, average or takes a distribution of all possible uh, background levels at that position and gives you the sort of the low, medium, median, and high percentile uh, at all over all time or over the whole visibility of that, that window. Um, so, fun fact here is that uh, when you see benchmark sensitivities for JWST, they're computed for a specific position at a specific time, and this is what it is. Uh, on RNDEC on June 19, 2019. Because backgrounds, you know, of course, change all the time. So, so any kind you, of benchmark. Where did you come up with that? Uh, this is the definition of the Zodi times 1.2. And it goes back to uh, to old uh, uh, background is estimates. Is that the ecliptic, and light C and is that the ecliptic pole of, position or something like that? What's that? 17 and a half minus 73, is that the ecliptic pole or something? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's close to, it's far away from the from the galactic plane. Uh, uh, but it can't be too low, right? I don't, yeah. don't want uh, you know, the lowest possible background. So it's, yeah, um, I got this from, from Jane. <laughs> All right. Um, so a, a key background component for JWC is stray light, right? Because it's not a baffled observatory, you get uh, you get light in from all sorts of, of sides, uh, and so it has it uses stray light model as well. Uh, so it follows light to see the most recent update on the stray light model from 2016 in SPIE, and so basically what what it does is it has a transfer function internally here, and this is a this is a transfer function over the sky, and the transfer function. Uh, gives you as a function of, uh, of telescope pointing, gives you how efficiently, uh, uh, or as, as a function of 
different places in the sky, how efficiently that light gets scattered into the into the line of sight. Then you have your sky and observation coordinates, right? So depending on where you're looking, you shift this around. Uh, and basically, these two get convolved, and you get the actual uh, uh, map of the uh, effective source radiance in observatory coordinates. And so this is this is all a very complicated, heavy calculation. It actually takes weeks or to 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 compute this as a huge library. Uh, so there's a big library that the the background model takes and inputs again as a function of uh, uh, position and time. And again, I don't think there's any other way to access this than the um, ETC web application. And then finally, for long wavelengths, you have the thermal self-emission from the uh, from the telescope, mostly from the primary. It's warm. It's, you know, it's not at absolute zero. It does have a temperature. Uh, and so beyond, you know, 12, 13 micron or something like that, JFC uh, um, starts to get dominated by the thermal component. Uh, and the black curve here is the one that is used in the, in the ETC here. And there's some uh, previous estimates, low low ball estimates, high ball estimates. It kind of goes in the in the middle between those. And so this is just a constant curve, it is what it is. Uh, ultimately, of course, uh, in orbit, uh, this curve is likely to be a bit different. Right? I mean, it's hard to predict exactly what it's going to be, but this is the best known um, uh, curve. So it's the best, the best, best guess. Is it what it's expected to change with time over the mission? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, in any case, so so that is a, it's a lot of things about the the, the ETC here. There is actually a, a sort of an infrastructure around it as well. It's been so the ETC has already been used in other um, in other uh, facilities and other tools. Uh, it has, for example, it has a dependency. The ETC has a dependency in WebPSF because WebPSF calculates the the point spread functions. But WebPSF also now takes the throughput from the ETC and uses that to calculate its own uh, high fidelity PSFs, right? So what you can you can go to the web PSF uh, website and you say I want the PSF uh, for near cam in the F200W filter, right? And so that's uh, that, that's web PSF calculations that's involved with a throughput curve. So it takes a throughput curve from the ETC. So there's a dependency that goes both ways here. Um, there's also there's a there's a W first ETC that uses uh, Pandaya. And there's also um, recently released uh, the Exoplanet Simulator, uh, also uses the ETC throughputs, so that um, everybody who's who's using um, JWST throughputs for something that they use the same consistent numbers. I think is the advantage of this. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so so this is the uh, this is the uh, the web web tool um, as it looks uh, as it looks today. Uh, and you can you can make your calculations here on the side. Uh, you can uh, this is the, the place you get in when you start it up. So this is the calculations tab. Uh, if you want to make very complicated uh, astronomical scenes, then you go into this tab here. It's called scenes and sources. <coughs> you can invent uh, um, you know, your own own scene. Um, uh, so this gives access to all the different instrument parameters. An easy way here. So this is the scene itself here. This is a, this is sort of a shortcut that you can get into the into the scene here and make quick uh, modifications to say I just want my single point source in the middle. I want it to be brighter. So you can go in here and there's a shortcut to access the scene data. Uh, there's a background here you can set up. There's instrument setup. That is the uh, uh, you know, which filter you want to use. There's a detector setup. So this is how you set the the exposure time. And you set that with number of groups in your RAM, number of integrations, number of exposures, subarrays, and readout patterns, and it'll give you the exposure time down here in the bottom. It's important to uh, note here that this doesn't really include any overheads. Uh, this is just a pure raw integration time. If you want to know the, the total time it takes for your observation to be done, you have to go to APT and input the, uh, the uh, exposure setup that you found was optimal in the ETC, and that will give you the total time that it will take. And then, as I talked a bunch about before, here's this tab. That's the strategy, so that's where you set uh, the sizes of your extraction apertures and that sort of thing. So fun fact here is that 
Uh, whenever you do a calculation, you can pick a calculation. You can go down here in the in the reports uh, output section, and you can actually download a tarball with all the ECC inputs and outputs, and in a convenient format. There's a lot of fits images and things in there, so you can explore it in, in your favorite uh, fits viewer. Um, because sometimes in the, I mean, the images here, if you if you show uh, if you make a spectral calculation, it shows your spectrum. So it gets squeezed all together. There's a lot more information potentially in there. So sometimes you may want to download it and look at it you know, close up. Um, all right. So how to use the uh, the ETC? I'm just going to go through a few of the modes here. Just just a few pointers. Um, so in regular imaging here, what what I did was uh, I figured well maybe. Uh, maybe I wanted to look at a, at a galaxy here, at a redshift of 0.5, uh, uh, using the source scene calculator. I made a, a, um, a red bulge, which has uh, I basically just took a spectrum of a, of a K star and uh, assigned that to the bulge here. And then I made a bunch of knots here, and I assigned starburst kind of star forming region kind of spec to those. So there's a lot of emission lines, PAHs in them. And then I arrange them in sort of a spiral-like pattern. Right? So this is sort of cartoony, but it gives you an idea of what, what you might do. And then uh, you know, one, one thing you can do with the ETC is then you can take this scene and then you can observe it with different modes. So that's what I did here. So I observed it with near cam, different filters. You have the long wavelength then uh, between 2.5 uh, two micron up to 4.6 micron. So three filters. I made an RGB. You can see the knots here and you can see the balls. And then I took the same scene and I also observed it with MIRI. Uh, uh, the short wavelength, and here, so about 5.6, from here, 5.6 micron up to 10 micron. Um, and for example, you see, I, I put a few different spectra in all these knots here. So you can see these two here, they turn out to be very red, so these are dusty kind of star formation regions uh, with MIRI, so they, they really light up at long wavelengths here while they actually blue, they appear blue at the shorter, shorter wavelengths for, uh, for Newton. Yeah? Um, can you import like a text file for your scene with having columns saying that's a point source or something like that, or do you have to do it by hand? Uh, so in the, in the user interface, uh, uh, there's no not functionality right now to import a text file. Uh, if you have really a lot of things, then the recommendation is to use the offline Python engine and you can do whatever. And with this, you, you can read it in, basically. They, they read it. Yeah. I mean, just using whatever your favorite Python tool is to read in tables. <laughs> um, so it's a little bit higher learning curve there, but you know it might be uh, might be worthwhile for some for some people. All right, so that's that's the uh, that's the imaging, uh, and so these are just the, these are sort of the, what do you call this the detector plane uh, outputs here. So these have the appropriate noise in them. I don't know. I remember what it is. I think this is like half an hour of uh, uh, integration or something like that. Uh, and then, of course, then you can take the same scene, and then you can also uh, observe it with spectroscopic modes here. So that's what I did here again. Same scene. Uh, I put a MIRI LRS slit on one of the sources. You can pick which source you want to look at in the, in the user interface. Uh, so it goes, it goes here. And then this is the MIRI LRS slitted uh, 2D image. And here you can see that there's a path feature here that's red shifted. But you can see the source here, and you can also see the background on top of that. So you can get an idea of what. You know exactly your background is relative to your uh, uh, to your source here. Yeah, of course, in this case, here a lot of some of the background is thermal, but a lot, some of the background is also coming from the actual galaxy bulge itself. And you can see you know, if you squint so here, here I put in this is a near spec MSA observation. You pick three shutters on top of each other. You can see the three shutters here. Um, you can see you get different background and different shutters here because it varies across the field. And you can actually, if you squint a little bit. You can see in the background, you can see some absorption features here that comes from the fact that I put a K-star spectrum in as a, as a bulge spectrum. So that's what you see there. And of course, you can see it has extracted this from your LRS, has extracted the actual signal to noise of your source with a background extraction as well. Um, all right, so a couple of fun facts here. So important thing in spectroscopic modes, when it reports signal to noise, the spectroscopic modes, the extraction aperture is uh, Right now, it's always one wavelength pixel wide. So it's a single to noise ratio per wavelength pixel, not per resolution element. So sometimes you'll see that you'll see um, single to noise average over two pixels because the resolution element is two pixels wide. But that's not the way the ATC is reporting. It's one wavelength pixel wide. So another 
uh, fun fact here is that you can you can upload your own spectra if you want and add lines. So if you make this quite complicated too. Uh, for instance, here I did that here. Uh, so so what I did was I took one of my favorite uh, models of uh, chemistry in a protoplanetary disk and just uploaded it into uh, into the ETC here and calculated the MURI MRS. Uh, simulate the signal um, throughout the spectral range here. And so you see all these emission lines from different molecules here that are marked here. And you can see, and you can see here the noise here goes up significantly at the longest wavelength of the MRS because the background goes up so much and the transmission goes down. Um, but you can see you can you can put in sort of pretty complicated spectra uh, as you like. Uh, there's one thing to be said about this here is that if you put in spectra that are very finely sampled, so ETC will tend to slow down a lot. So if you find that, that it's getting very slow, uh, recommendation is to look at the spectrum you're using and maybe not sample it, at least not sample it finer than you have to, uh, given the, the sampling of the, uh, the actual instrument. Um, another interesting, another thing to note here is that when you do IFU calculations, both near spec and near, you always do a dither to subtract background. These dithers are not necessarily the exact same ones that available in APT, but it sort of simulates, approximates what you do get from a dither uh, without getting into detail like, about the exact dither patterns, because it's not going to make any difference for uh, what signal to noise you get within the ETC framework here. But what you'll see is you'll see something like this here if you're doing a uh, dither inside your field, which is something you will do for, uh, for a point source, um, and you'll get this blank piece around here, and that's because you do, you do one dither offset. Yeah, and it only shows the overlapping region. And so, so that there's a blank, blank area here by, by the sign. All right, finally, some things to say about our chronographic modes. Uh, so there are kind of chronographic modes in there. They're probably currently the most restricted as a mode. Um, and, and you have to think, I think, a little bit more carefully about what you're doing when you use the ETC chronographic modes than for, for the other modes. Uh, one point, to, important point to make here, it will it will accurately model point sources, uh, but it, when you start to do extended sources, it's not as accurately modeled. And a big reason for that is if you put a, an extended source behind your your occulter, uh, what basically, or actually for all, for all the chronographic modes, what you have is you have a position dependent PSF. That's a dependent where you put a source, the PSF changes. If you put your source right behind the you know, an occulting spot, that PSF, of course, is very different than if you put it far away by the sign. I mean, that's why, that's why you have a chronograph. Uh, but if you put an extended source around uh, uh, across the field here, then uh, uh, and to see if it has no way to convolve that with a PSF that changes dramatically across the field. And so that means if you put an extended source right in the middle of the occulter here, that's not going to be modeled right. Uh, you can put a little extended source up here, and you'll be fine. But, but you have to be careful with what you do. So it's, it's really intended for point sources. Um, also, currently, uh, we only do perfect subtraction for your PSF reference, because it's not realistic. But, but basically, you think about it as uh, your chronographic calculation is something you can use to assess your shot noise. Right? So that's your fundamental limit for how well you can do. If you never do better than shot noise, you're probably going to do worse. Uh, and it will also a allow you to assess saturation, which is an important, another important consideration for chronography. All right, um, we did a, a lot of work uh, benchmarking the ETC calculations to make sure that, that we're getting something that's sensible and correct. Um, there is a requirement in the ETC is, uh, is to get to 10% uh, of the uh, signal to noise ratio that you would expect. Uh, this is not, importantly, it's not 10% of the, I mean, the requirement, it doesn't refer to 10% of the in-orbit performance because nobody knows really what the enormous performance will be. We have a best guess, right? Um, and we have requirements for the for the enormous performance. Well, the 10% is, is actually meant to be 10% of, of what uh, the best possible simulation might give you. That's completely correct. Uh, so so the, the intent here is that you do some um, some approximations in ETC, and, but the approximation shouldn't be worse than 10%. Uh, so what we did was we compared uh, the C limiting sensitivities, which are 10 sigma, 10,000 seconds. That's the one comparison case. Uh, and so we know that that is, that is relevant for, for very deep 
integrations, not necessarily for all the science cases, but this was, this was one important one. Um, so we compared that to all major instrument modes, the independent calculations that are typically provided by the instrument teams. No relevant, no, no, um, uh, no common components with each C. They did theirs, we did ours. Compare them. Um, uh, and uh, basically the idea was to look at if you use the same data and you use the same assumptions, we wanted to get within 10%. And if we do that, then we have some confidence that the algorithms are appropriate and accurate. Uh, and so we did that successfully. Now, of course, uh, for the flight release, uh, going forward, we have different backgrounds. We may start to see uh, updates or changes to reference files. So the ETC numbers have that, or the numbers that ETC will output may diverge a bit, uh, certainly over the mission, from what the original benchmark was done at. Uh, but that's just because the reference data change, not because the algorithms change. Right? So this, this gives us confidence that the algorithms and the underlying calculation engine is correct here. So here's a. An example comparison, this is the MIRI uh, throughputs for MRS, um, and here by design, right, the throughputs are the same. Uh, and, and these are all examples of validations for imaging modes here. The circles and the stars should go on top of each other. Uh, some spectroscopic modes, this near spec here, and this nearest, which is a slitless uh, comparison. All right. Um, Okay, so uh, just a few things, I'm almost done. Here. So just a few things to mention about real life ETC results versus standard sensitivities. So um, there are many parameters that affect ETC sensitivities. Once you start using it, there are some things you need to be, I mean, you should think a little bit and things to be aware of. Uh, uh, I mean, we have a lot of parameters because that's the point of having a versatile tool, right? But uh, you, can, you can definitely change the predictor signal to noise by changing the parameters. Right, so for example, think about your background subtraction. Here's a, in the ETC, uh, we, when you submit, you, you usually you have an option here to subtract your background with some region, like an aperture photometry, or you can select just a noiseless sky background. What that means is that somehow magically you know what the background is and you can subtract it without adding any noise. Of course, the lower one here is going to give you the higher signal to noise ratio than the other one. Um, think about what, what extraction aperture is optimal. Uh, default isn't necessarily optimal for your source, depending on if you have a point or an extended source. So think about what, where that goes, and you can change your your, your actual result. Uh, is your background correct for your target? Here's an example here. You put in your background here. Does anybody know what this background, what this position is? Well, let's see. It's about uh, 50 degrees away from that other one you had. Yeah. Oh, this it's a galactic center. Oh. Right, so obviously you point to the galactic center of your background, it's going to be a lot higher than somewhere else, so it's going to change your sensitivity by a lot. Um, different readout patterns change the read noise, um, and the ETC does cut some corners. For instance, there's no distortion generally, except for nearest source, which does have distortion. No. Um, and also, there's a lot of information. Uh, we've been working really hard on, on documentation as well. Uh, you can find a lot of the ETC documentation already on the, on the DLPST documentation site here. Uh, there's also known issues and other things and other links useful for documentation in the calculators. We go down to help here if you look at the known issues. And so be sure to check that once in a while because it gets updated. Um, there's the DLPST help desk. Uh, and so if you really get stuck, you can use that as well. And please. Finally, you know, have patience with us. We're working really hard and you know, getting all the documentation done and getting everything, everything right. But you know, it's a lot of work. Uh, so there is more to come. So uh, thank you very much. Does anyone in the room have questions for Klaus? Uh, um, I wanted to go back to the dither patterns. I was not sure if I understood what you said that you, when you choose dither, you always subtract the background. Was that right? For, for IFUs, there's always a dither done, and that the purpose of that is to subtract the background. Um, so what if I have an extended object, so I want to do dithers, and I want to see how it's then right. looks. So uh, somewhat, let's see, where is it? Um, so this was one of the original ideas behind the strategies, is that given observing mode, you may want to use different observing strategies. And so Many of the modes only really have one at the moment. You can add more, but IFU is an example where you have to 
And one is a dither inside your field for point sources. Another one is the dither off. And with the dither off, all you get is just the background, which is assumed it's a blank field. Mm -hmm. And you get subtracted. And that's yeah, what you lose for extended sources. Okay. And then, and then, by the way, if you dither off, then you don't get this bar. Yeah, sure. You know, it was just because the APT offers like the not and the dither, where the dither is really just dithering without sub background subtraction, and the not is the one for background subtraction. Right, right, right. And yeah. you, you still want to dither even if you don't do background subtraction with at least the near spec I view because you undersample otherwise your field I view right, right, oversample. Right, right. Yeah. So yeah, I was just wondering if that's intended to do to yeah, be yeah. included at some point. Just uh, the like like it. really complex dithers, I don't know. I mean, so it's it's um, we add things to the ETC if it really changes the signal to noise in some fundamental way. Uh, uh, so keeping up with specific dithers that are available in APT uh, is difficult difficult for us, uh, especially if it doesn't change the signal to noise. It might change your sampling, right? But the ETC is not going to start to subsample I view calculations. It's just, it's just one step too far for us. So, this is another question. I'm sorry. Unless this is a continuation. Well, it was meant to be. I'm sorry. Uh, but I'm trying to understand. If I'm say as an example, using the near spec IFU three arc second square. If I if I have an extended source, it only knows the extent to which is extended, so to speak, uh, from my scene building, which is a mere approximation. Does that offset within that three arc second field of view, or can it be further away? Is that essentially a mosaic that you're creating if you go further away? Um, um, so basically, the li the limitation I means you're talking about um, the the dither inside the field of view, like this kind of this case here. Well, so any, see, because any, any of by the overlap you have, right? If you if you increase your dither here, then this white bar, bar here gets bigger and bigger. At some point, you just don't fit anymore. So it just does one, just to simulate what happens when you subtract when you sort of self subtract back. You said that essentially anything can be scripted using that Python module. Is well, there essentially anything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. But uh, are there some examples somewhere that, that one could look at? Let's say a simple ETC case that, that yes. is scripted. Yeah, we provided that for uh, uh, for a recent workshop. I can find it. There. So, oh, so you had it there, okay? Yeah, yeah, right, right. So here there's a couple of very basic examples for basically how to import the ETC, how to point to the data package and how to run a basic image calculation. And then within the uh, within the engine itself, there's an API document, so you can see what parameters you have available. Great, thanks. Uh, if, if we're not interested in absolute background subtraction, uh, can we just set the dither to be some very long exposure time so it doesn't take a noise hit? Uh, right now, I think the at least the user the user interface assumes the same integration time for both. I mean, there's nothing you know, technically preventing us from doing it in different ways. But right now, the user interface I think that's the only way you can do it. In the engine, uh, I'm not sure. Um, I don't remember it. If that's limited, you, know, but you might be able to script it differently. Okay, I think Tom Green has a question for you online. So Tom, I just unmuted you if you want to go ahead and ask your question. Top of my head, I know that the Gaussian is actually a special case of the Sursic profile, uh, so it should be parameterized in the same way. Um, uh, but I can check that for you. It's pretty easy. If you say it's a sigma, it probably is. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Tom, I was messing around with the microphone. Could you uh, repeat your question? Yes, I think these these will automatically be made available. That's right. So um, everything's going to be uh, posted to webcast. So um, it'll probably be available within the, the next couple of days. Sure. Does anyone online have any other questions? 
Um, if not, let's thank Klaus again um, for giving this uh, nice talk today. Um, there's going to be another talk in two weeks, which will be um, Bill Blair talking about the APT and the target visibility tool. Okay, have a great week, everybody.